Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be in Lisbon. So this is my hometown. I've been you know, lucky enough to work remotely from this place for several months a year. I hope you are enjoying it. So you have been seeing 30 degrees flat over these days. It has been like this, I don't know, since March. Uh, I was even chatting with my colleagues in Singapore and they said they had like 28. So it's becoming better to be in Singapore sometimes than, than, than here in Lisbon. But first things first, so I would like really to thank Diraj and Jason for the invite. When I was here yesterday, I felt there is something special about this event, and it's just not because you decided to come to Lisbon. But the way you look into innovation, you know, and the way you expose it, Jason, I, I enjoyed seeing the way you decode it. And, and by being here yesterday, I had to kind of review the storyline, uh, because blending that with what Diraj sh shared about the MNO pressure and the walkway conversation and the job cuts, I think we have a mission to help and give you uh, some tools that you know, in, in your daily decisions and strategy making, you can use. Um, and because of that, I think maybe sharing my story about this place here, where you are today, and the way this helps with innovation would be a good start. So I, I won't bother you much, but typically I come here with you know, my three kids. The last time I was here, you know, originally was 25 years ago when this place was founded, it was Worldwide Expo 1998. Um, and, and now when I come with them, they always ask, Daddy, but what's new? What's the innovation? And I don't say there's nothing new, but I say let's explore. And really my speech about conversions today, it's around those lines. So when they come and they experiment, there is always something new. So they go play with the Newton you know, experiments, they do some bubbles, there is the elliptical billard pool, and they always find a way to make it different. Um, yeah, so, and with that, I think, Private 5G and Wi-Fi 6C and Wi-Fi 7, they are really about building new highways. But for those highways, we also need new services and new go-to-market strategies. So let me see if I can advance here the slides. Um, and from the WB standpoint, what we do for this convergence mission is more about the ecosystem. So we have mobile operators, cable operators, some of the internet players that Tiraj alluded to, like you know, Google, Meta, then we have device infrastructure, chipset vendors, and everyone comes, integrators, hubs, signiverse, you know, everyone around the same tables discussing these topics and how they can leverage the best of the technologies they have really to increase the ROI and the, uh, deliver new services to their end customers. Yeah, we work across technical work groups. We have now around uh, 200 members that has grown from, from 75 four years ago. So I think this you know, showcases the relevance of some of these topics about wireless um, and how we need really you know, to come up with these seamless experiences. But having said this, um, in terms of the impact, why network convergence should be part of the agenda today? And I just put here our roadmap and the work groups and across every single work group, even though we have this original focus on Wi-Fi, you know, 5G always comes, IoT, private seller, even satellite backhaul was the main subject of one of our innovation forums recently. And everyone thinks, okay, forget about the highways, but if we look into these four use cases, you know, high density stadiums, venues, deployments, uh, you know, in busy city centers, then some type of remote uh, mobility networks, moving networks, we call it, you know, planes, trains, boats, and then also the remote corporate teleworker. So there is new pressure, you know, for the household also sometimes to bring the enterprise services into the home. And, and really this is the way we have been trying to say convergence is here and we really need to make sense of that strategy. But yes, yeah, so 5G, 5G deployments, and if we look into the 3GPP, you know, release 14, 15, the mother of all networks. That was part of the scope when those, you know, initial market requirement documents were being, you know, developed and delivered. And I think maybe this picture, you know, summarizes the way it should be. So if we go talk with, you know, MNOs and R&D teams, it's not exactly yet like this, but I think the standards are evolving really to have this multi-mode device and try to make the best use of all the different means we have. And you know, all is best connected is kind of the, the, the Mecca word for, for all of this. But what I would like to say about you know, convergence as well is the, the new trends in terms of the use cases that are motivating 
teams to just invest time in exploring this. And, and the use cases you have here on the screen, I personally worked for a mobile operator for five years. Um, and what I find interesting is that 10 years ago, we were having these discussions, Diraj. So are we going to become a dump pipe? What should we do? How can we get IoT value chains, machine to machine? Let's do smart metering. And when we talk with these experts, you know, fellows from all these companies, they come and they say, look, these are the use cases. I would say 80% of these use cases, I was talking about them you know, 12 years ago. But what I think is different is now that with some of the uh, physical and Mac layers of private 5G and Wi-Fi 7, there is a more you know, flexible way of IT managers, CIOs, to think about the deployment side of things. So we have launched this uh, you know, uh, piece of work that is the key use cases and requirements for private 5G and Wi-Fi convergence. So it's available, it's open. I recommend you just to you know, go and take a look. It includes a blend of these use cases, motivation, and also the technical requirements from a 3GPP, IEEE, and Wi-Fi Alliance standpoint. And it's kind of the blueprint if you are thinking in some of these, of these deployments. Then, um, I think you know, this picture is one of the most popular amongst the industry, I would say, that is looking into how to... Um, because within even a company, I get... You know, I got really upset several years ago when we were talking with different divisions within the company and someone told me from you know, the seller side, look, every bit I take from my seller network, it's one bit that I put on yours and I don't justify the ROI to invest in you know, 4G by that time. You know, and that doesn't make sense. The company needs to have a converged strategy. And this is basically the IMT 2020 requirements for 5G. So it's you know, the, 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 the circle that makes you know, all these dimensions around you know, peak data rates, user experience. That's what ITU said, look guys, if you have a candidate technology for 5G, you need to comply with this. But then what we did, we overlay with you know, Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7. And if you just look into the blend of both, clearly Wi-Fi was not built for mobility. We don't expect to be in a highway and you have like, I don't know, a huge throughput, 100 megabit, 200 megabit throughput, or even the network efficiency for long scale deployments will also not apply. But what I would say, again, uh, Diraj, I liked when you asked what the management should be talking in the hallways. Uh, and I say, 5G ROI. So, and then that's one of the motivations that they always come to us and said, look guys, let's focus on getting this 5G NR right first, forget about Wi-Fi or forget about private networks for now, and 5G ROI. But if you look you know, from a business standpoint, you can accelerate the time to market. This is free, widely available spectrum. More spectrum is coming. Um, the lower cost per bit, and you can enhance the carrier grade integration using you know, over the top technologies like open roaming or 3GPP driven technologies like ATSSS. So definitely this, this makes sense in our, in our perspective. And again, we have the highway, but let's get those services and that convergence uh, going. Then a bit more you know, you know, technical, and we can discuss you know, during the questions or during the break. But another angle that I don't see often you know, mentioned is for private 5G. So this is kind of moving all the car into a, a bucketized approach you know, that you can deliver to an enterprise. Maybe a city will deploy private networks, we are not sure, but clearly the use case, it's industry 4.0, you know, very you know, high density you know, type venues, airports, factories. And again, if we put ourselves on the shoes of a CIO that already manages some Wi-Fi network, some agreements with MNOs, we come up with these four you know, use cases for deployment and you can see that you cannot just go to a factory and say, look, do this very nice private 5G network. You have these automation machines, you are BMW or you are, I don't know, Mercedes, and it will solve all your problems. No, there are the laptops. There are you know, the, the tablets that they use for augmented reality and monitoring. So the message here is there is now a way for you to give a blueprint if you are a vendor or if you are an MNO working with those industry players, you can just give them a blueprint on the options they have. So there is you know, cloud options, hybrid options, on-prem options, but for instance, you know, we work with a factory that is Metis Aerospace in the UK, and they build missiles. They build you know, plane components. They want everything on-prem. So there must be teams within the MNOs to go there, help them build you know, this core um, this core infrastructure on the top left, right, and just then make some interoperability tests, conversions, and get things going on, on that way. Then, um, 
The other approach that is complementary, and now I'm moving from the highways part of it, more into the way of you making some revenues or at least deploying new services with assets that you already invested. I can you know, talk about a few examples, but maybe I will just talk about AT&T, and I, I, I keep saying, let's be more AT&T, so we don't, I don't wear AT&T shirt, but I, I like what they do. They are fast, they move, and they really manage to make a sense of, if we do conversions, their revenues, the bottom line, went up. It's not about you know, seller, Wi-Fi, IoT, bundle, give a better service to the customer, and they will, they will pay more and upgrade to the premium package. So, open rooming for private 5G and Wi-Fi 7. I think MNOs, they have a unique asset, so they have the mobile identity and you have SIM cards. So virtually there are billions of SIM cards in the world, and those SIM cards, if we connect those users to a federation, they become enabled to go all over the world, whether it's inbound or outbound traffic from a rooming standpoint. And then on the other side, we have these venues that we call network providers that could be factories. This pavilion, I think, you know, you also mentioned the Wi-Fi here, and if you just go and see the Wi-Fi, it says unsecured network. Look, no one wants that, and we, you know, as an industry, we need to do a better job because we can just put people there seamlessly on a secure way. So really what I would like to share about this is that there is a readily available solution today if you are building your business plans and you are thinking about private 5G and Wi-Fi 7. Open Rooming is a framework that can help you, you know, drive that forward. But then another, you know, topic that is quite often mentioned but there is not yet, uh, let's say, a, a unique strategy is the neutral host. There are many definitions for neutral host. But what we believe the approach for neutral host should be is, okay, who is the credential owner? So if I'm an MNO, I own the SIM card or use SIM, I can basically use that identity to just drive different users amongst different networks. This example, okay, I'm an MNO, I'm AT&T, I have my AT&T Wi-Fi in Austin, Texas, I have my public 3GPP network, I can manage intercarrier roaming with whatever, you know, some of those vendors can sell me, you know, Nokia, Huawei, and so on. And basically that works. But if they want just to open their users more to the ecosystem, they can use the NPN, the, the, the Non-Public Network Concept Federation from TGPP release 16 and 17, to basically put people on private Wi-Fi from a city. So Tokyo just launched a major private network around this, but also private enterprises. And really what we are trying to solve is today, you know, we have 800 mobile operators in the world, but when it comes to private 5G, it might be like Wi-Fi. You can have thousands, dozens of thousands of networks, and if they all do an isolated deployment, imagine a factory go to do an agreement with here in Portugal, Altis, Vodafone, NOS, Novo. You know, it's virtually impossible to have, even the MNO would have to scale their teams considerably if they wanted all this offload from mobile operators. So the solution, the vision is, applying uh, the NPN Federation at, let's say, no cost or residual cost, work with your partners, the, the Signiverses of the world, you know, single digits, all those apps, some internal skills like Timo, and just make it work. And yeah, so this is just one example. So this is in practice, works with PLMN IDs. I see some of you are from the rooming world. So this is the concept of shared PLMN ID. Um, I was just checking here at the time. So shared PLMN ID, Everyone uses the shared PLMN ID, you have the identities, you connect it to the federation, you manage it, and you have you know, this 5G, private 5G roaming, and you kind of add a service layer on top of what you are already uh, doing. But yeah, so just a bit about Spectrum. I think it's virtually impossible not to talk about Spectrum when it comes to Wi-Fi 7 or, or to private 5G. So private 5G, as you can see, there is a slight issue in terms of normalizing the bands. There is an effort from the different you know, regulations all over the world to just come and converge on some single bands. That puts some pressure on the device vendors on the way they will support it. But as you can see, even between Asia and Europe and US, there is already some division. Maybe you know, N79, N78 will be the normalization uh, for some of these regions, but we are, we are not sure. But that's a critical... Uh, success factor. Then, what's happening also with Wi-Fi 7 um, is a standard power. And when it comes to standard power, this is the first time ever in the industry that an unlicensed technology will be able to increase their power in outdoor environment. So if you think about a stadium or a city, you know, all those, you know, macro or, or, or centralized coverage that was being done can now be covered by some of these, of these technologies. So again, from an MNO standpoint, when you are developing a business case 
for a certain location or even doing the macro planning of your network, makes sense to start including private 5G and Wi-Fi 6E and Wi-Fi 7. So then, yeah, technically we can discuss it, but there are several new things. So Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 7 evolved to support OFDMA, uh, multi-link operation that were traditional technologies from the cellular world that now moved into Wi-Fi. And yeah, just to finalize, I think Daniel brought the map. Looks like we have a, a map, a map type presentations here. But again, if we think about a real world example, so we hosted one of our last events here in Chicago, and these are with the blue ellipse. It's like the hotel where we were, and we just did the demo. Okay, so if we were to deploy a mixed private 5G and Wi-Fi network here, how it would, would, would like in terms of any impact with the spectrum or any dependencies. And you can see the, the, the blacks are kind of the, the links from FCC, like to cover maritime or the airport. And this is what it comes. But when you do a step, a step down, the reality is if we go closer to the hotel, we have pretty much all the spectrum available. So it was possible to do in that very busy Chicago location, a full-fledged AFC standard power deployment of Wi-Fi 7 and private 5G, complementing you know, seller coverage or just catering to the local use case. So what I would like to say, this is real, you know, it's happening, it's still time just to get inside and try to just make a sense and a strategy out of it. Um, and yeah, so the work will continue. So we have, uh, I mentioned the initial paper, but the phase two, We'll just go into a bit more you know, technical details on the architecture, things like fast transition, uh, authentication of you know, non-SIM devices, QoS, latency. All this is kind of being you know, driven as a phase two, and eventually it will be part of Converse trials. And if any of you would like to join or participate on these trials, I would be more than happy uh, just to get you on board. And with this, I thank your time, and over to you, Diraj. Thank you. Thank you.